Methods that scale with computation are the future of AI. AI is going distributed. Those words come from Rich Sutton, and it's significant that it comes from him, because he developed RL with others, and that was distinctly not scalable. It didn't scale with compute. It was single agent, single threaded. But in the last few years, this has changed significantly. So what we've seen in the last few years, if we take as a starting point, um, we go back to the uh, AlexNet, which was really the starting point for using hardware accelerators. Uh, to do deep learning. That was a state-of-the-art in ImageNet at beat. And if we look at all of the improvements in the state-of-the-art we've seen since then, we've had a massive 300,000-fold improvement or increase in the amount of compute being used to train these models. The doubling time for this, if you look at it, is every 3.5 months. The doubling time uh, is as every 3.5 months, we've managed to double the amount of compute that's being used to train these models. And if you compare that with Moore's law, in Moore's law, every 18 months, we double the number of transistors on a, on, a, on a chip. NVIDIA haven't managed to do that. They haven't doubled the number of cores every 3.5 months. What happened was we hit a wall around 2016. And if you think about CPUs, they hit a wall and they went to multi-core. Well, in, in distributed computing, or sorry, in AI, we went to distributed systems. So if you look at, at AlphaGo, AlphaGo would not have beaten the world's best Go player if it wasn't distributed. So what is a distributed deep learning system? There's two types of distributed deep learning that you'll see out there. One is what we call model parallelism. That's when you have a model that won't fit on, in memory on a single GPU. So if you take Google's machine translation model, which is about a terabyte in size, that won't fit on many GPUs. So you need to split it up over many GPUs. I'm not going to talk very much about that today because model level parallelism is really not something most of the people here will be working with. You'll be interested in what we call data level parallelism. If I have a number of GPUs and I want to maybe train and model faster, how can I do it? Well, you can do it by basically having a copy of your model at every GPU. And then each GPU on an iteration will read in a part, a small part of the mini batch. So you have an iteration with a mini batch. And if you have 100 GPUs and a batch size of 3,200, each GPU will read in 32 samples or files. Uh, they'll, train their, uh, they'll run the forward pass, calculate some gradients. And then what will happen is you'll aggregate those gradients together. And you'll then generate a new copy of the model and the cycle will continue. Now, many of you will know that this is what we call synchronous stochastic gradient descent. There is an asynchronous model, but it has poor convergence time guarantees. So I'm going to talk mostly about synchronous um, stochastic gradient descent. Now, what's happened in the last year has been very interesting, because deep learning years are kind of like dog years. You know, in the five years I talked about this computing increase, that's like half a lifetime in deep learning years. If we go to just one year, we take the last year and say, well, what has happened? Well, Google and Facebook, personified here by Jeff Dean and Jan LeCun, they've been competing in, in, in the modern-day ImageNet, which is the modern-day uh, MNIST. So they've been saying, well, can we train better models on ImageNet, and can we do it faster? And they've been doing it with ConvNets, and they've been doing it with distribution. And the ImageNet, in case you're not familiar with it, it's a big data set. It's 300 gigabytes. It's a million images for training and 100,000 images for testing. And there's 1,000 different classes of uh, objects in the image that you try to identify. So the top one prediction will be the one that if your best prediction matches what's in the image, then you get it correct. So what have they done? What have they competed in? Well, firstly, they've been trying to improve the accuracy of ImageNet. So been trying to train models where you can get higher accuracy on ImageNet. And Google kicked this off about a year ago. They had a, a very interesting paper called Neural Architecture Search, where they use reinforcement learning, lots and lots of compute, to generate a better model than the best experts could generate. And they improved the state of the art in ImageNet. And then earlier this year, in March, they actually improved on this, but they used genetic algorithms instead of reinforcement learning. Facebook took a different approach to improving the state of the art. They actually went with more data. So they took a billion images uh, that were hand-labeled from Instagram, and they basically pre-trained a model with it. So those images are not necessarily, they don't necessarily have correct labeling. They just trust what the users supply. They're public images from Instagram. And uh, with that, they managed to improve on the state of the art. So what's interesting with, with just the data aspect is they knew in advance that this would improve the state of the art. So there's been some results from Google and from Baidu showing you get a logarithmic improvement in training performance and prediction accuracy uh, as you add more data. 
So if you're a company and you're thinking about, well, I want to build the best deep learning prediction model, I want to reduce the generalization error, how am I going to do it? Well, you can develop a new dropout, you can develop a new second order optimization algorithm, or you can do distribution. And distribution will give you this predictable improvement in model accuracy as you throw more compute and data at the problem. So the second thing they kind of competed on was, can we improve the training time, reduce the training time for training ImageNet? And Facebook, Facebook kicked off this they, uh, about a year ago. They had a very well-known paper where they said, we can reduce the training time for ImageNet from two weeks to one hour. And they did it with 256 GPUs. And Google said, well, we can do better. You know, we're Google. Uh, we got it down to 30, 30 minutes and then down to 18 minutes recently this year. So what's interesting about this is how do they measure uh, how fast they're training? Well, what they use is actually a metric called number of files per second they process. And you can see that Facebook is hitting about 40,000, and Google got up to 140,000. And Facebook were, are training on open source technology. They're actually storing their data in HDFS. And uh, HDFS, we know from experience, has a, a limit of about 80,000. So they'll hit that bottleneck pretty quick. And that's where we come in. So in Stockholm, we've been developing a new version, a drop-in replacement for HDFS called Hops. And it won the IEEE Scale Challenge last year. And we got to 1.2 million operations per second with um, Spotify's workload. So if Facebook need to scale anymore, they can come talk to us, and we try and help them out. They know my number. I'm here. So just to kind of summarize this, a distribution is incredibly important now in pushing the state of the art in, in deep, deep learning. And there's lots of different branches of it that are feeding into it. We have parallel experiments, distributed training that I've mentioned, bigger training data sets, auto ML, even elastic uh, model serving is, is distribution. The issue is that I've experienced, as I, I, I teach at the university in Stockholm, and I have a course, 130 students who take a course in deep learning and, and large-scale machine learning, and mostly they're Python people from machine learning. They're not data engineers. And they don't really like having to work with big data. We make them work with multi-data, uh, gigabyte data sets. And I had to think about this, and I said, well, why? So I tried to write down 10 reasons why I think we, as distributed systems people, are failing you as data scientists. So this is my top 10 list of why uh, big data or distribution sucks. Number one, and this was the biggest problem we had, I don't know which is scarier, reading Stephen King's horror novel, It, or reading a file from HDFS in Python. That, that was the big kicker for most people. Number two, MapReduce. How can a programming model with only two parts have quadratic complexity? I don't know, it's a miracle, a mystery. Number three, I managed to install Hadoop at the cost of my last relationship. The spark died. Something had to give, and it wasn't going to be Hadoop. Number four, Jupiter's down again. Some service you never heard of stopped it from working. That's actually the classic definition of a distributed system. Number five, I still don't know which is worse, a dead service or a dead slow service. Slow services we hate, right? Because we, you know, will I turn it off, will I not? Number six, how do I debug this thing on my laptop? I still don't have an answer for that. Number seven, if it works, we're going to go. Enough with the Docker files and YAML files. When can I start writing real code? Those of you who work with Kubernetes will, uh, will know about this, so kubeflow. Number eight, isn't it supposed to be faster when I add a new server? If you've worked with distributed TensorFlow, you will know what I mean. The next one is for Hadoop people. Do I really have to install the library on all of the servers? Uh, yes, I think. Uh, and the last one, of course, is uh, are you not ready for it? Are you ready for it? Um, distributed, I don't even do multi-threaded. Come on. If you're interested in doing distribution, you say, well, this is kind of might be something that I can think about because I'm a... Uh, you know, uh, I'm working with a relatively large data set, and I'd like to train faster, I'd like to do parallel experiments. You can go to the cloud. There's many managed platforms that do support distributed machine learning, distributed deep learning. Um, here's a number of them here. All the cloud providers have their own flavor. And there's a couple of on-premise platforms. Kubeflow from Google just recently released, which works on Kubernetes, where you write YAML files and Docker files, and you write your code in Jupyter, and, and you know, schedule it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Hops. Hops is a platform that we've developed in Stockholm. It's an open source, big data, data science, GPUs, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras platform with Spark and Kafka and things like that. And it's the world's most scalable Hadoop platform, as I said. And it's European, just to top it off, which is nice. So 
What I'm going to just show you is how we encourage Python developers to write a whole ML pipeline in Python, only Python, no infrastructure code at all. So everything from da data collection to data wrangling to parallel experimentation to training and serving. And I'm going to do a little kind of jokey thing here, as I do with my kids. You know, you know when you draw the pictures where you flip them over and back and the guy goes up and down with the sword? So I'm going to do it with our biggest problem, which is getting people to work with data in HDFS. So imagine you want to write some code in, with pandas and you want to read in a file. This is what it's going to look like. It's pretty straightforward code. Assume this HDFS object gives you a local file path. And what it's going to do is it's going to read up a file and create this pandas data frame. What will it look like in HDFS? Well, it kind of looks like this. So let's flip over and back. The flicker works now. Um, so that's it. That's the difference, right? It's, it's one extra line in our code. We're going to just add a HDFS object, and with that, we can open files. So that's not too bad. Now, if you want to do data wrangling, what kind of open source tools are there out there? Well, we, we're using Google Facets as a platform. It's really nice. It's a, it's a plug into Jupyter. It allows you to do deep dive on code to look at data distributions. It look, allows you to compare training and, and test data distributions. It allows you to find things like missing column values, uh, mins, means, and maxes for columns. It works well with um, with uh, data frames. Uh, it's not really big data, so you often will have to subsample your data to work with it. But it's really easy to code, because you just take a pandas data frame like this, and you just call facets overview or facets dive, and you'll get a nice interactive view of it. Now, what happens if you want to now do some data wrangling? So typically, I would have had a slide here and say, here's how you do it in TensorFlow, and here's the data set API. And the data set API is kind of OK, but it's going to run on one server. I'd like to write some code which will scale as I add machines, as I add executors, in this case with Spark. And the nice thing about Spark and PySpark is that it is very Pythonic. So if you look at this code, the first line says, I'm going to read some images in a folder. And it's going to read all of them recursively through the entire subtree. It only wants 10% of them. I could make it 1% or 100%. And then here's the magic part. I can say number of partitions. Do it on 10. Do it on 20 executors. Do it on 100 executors. And then in, in PySpark, we have transformers that we can use to actually then, in parallel on all, on all the executors, transform this image, resize it, crop it. And there's another library from uh, this one is from, from Yahoo, TensorFlow and Spark, which will allow me to save that data frame uh, as TF records, which we can use then to train directly the system in TensorFlow. So as you move, progress in your pipeline, you might want to do parallel experimentation. You might want to do training, distributed training. In Hops, we have some uh, libraries to allow you to do very easy grid search. This is quite Pythonic. You firstly define a function, your train function, and you put your hyperparameters in there. So if you want a third hyperparameter, not just learning rate and dropout, you just add it to that particular method uh, definition. And then you'll add another entry in the dict. So the dict here contains all of the combinations of hyperparameters we want to run. So in this case, it's going to run six different executors in parallel with different combinations of learning rates and uh, dropout rates. And this is pretty transparent to you. you know, as, a, as a programmer, you can pretty quickly figure out, OK, it's going to write all this, and I'll get some results back. I'll show you in a second that we get these results in, in um, TensorBoard, which is nice. So even advanced things. So we had one student group who, who implemented model architecture search using genetic algorithms. And we included it in the framework. It works very well. You can, again, define the hyperparameters that you're interested in exploring. And then you can define parameters for your genetic search algorithm, number of uh, generations you want to run, crossover rates, mutation rates, and let the thing go. And the nice thing about this is this is going to run on 10 different executors, is that you can just watch it in TensorBoard. You can see as it, as it runs over the generations, we can see in this case it's training CIFAR 10. And we can see that you know, they're getting relatively good accuracy. And we didn't have to design a model architecture. We didn't have to say how many layers we have, you know, what we want to put in there. Uh, do we want batch norm in there or not? So if you want to do distributed training, Horovod is a, an open source platform by Uber. And it's, uh, it, it layers on top of something called MPI, but we support it uh, internally in Hops. But the code is actually really straightforward. You just wrap your, uh, dis your optimizer inside Horovod's distributed optimizer, and that's pretty much it. And you have some methods you might want to use, like the number of 
uh, executors that are running in size, or you might want to say, what's my particular rank? So maybe the, the host that's running at local rank will save the models periodically. And then finally, when it comes to model serving, uh, in Hops we have a UI. You can just select your model that you've output, uh, that you've saved, and you can just start it running. It's quite familiar to people who've used Google ML, and it will give you an endpoint, and with that endpoint you can write a client using gRPC to, to make predictions on the model. There's a whole area of, of how do we monitor models, how do we retrain models uh, when the data distribution, the input data distribution differs from the one we trained on, um, but that's a whole other talk. So just to summarize, uh, deep learning, it's going distributed. Um, Hops is this European platform we've been working on in Sweden to help bring together a lot of open source technologies into a big data GPU platform. And really, we can see that the whole of the deep learning space is moving towards distribution as an underlying technology to enable us to achieve this vision that Andre Kaparthi talks about, which is that he expects deep learning workflows of the future um, to be auto-tuned feature architectures running on auto-tuned compute schedules across arbitrary backends. Thank you. <laughs>